What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to HQ. This is BDGE, Big Dogs Got E Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas. Every Saturday, we're going to be coming at you with some DFS action. Now, I don't play DFS, but we have good friend of the show, Joe Holka, who is co-host of the Fantasy Footballers DFS podcast, as well as producing his own DFS content on his channel, which I will link down below. You can follow him on Twitter. He has been on the channel before to talk about the behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry. So we will be talking all about DFS with Joe today and his top picks, some stacks he likes, and other nonsense DFS related, because I know a lot of y'all play DFS. We got to make sure all the dogs is eating out here. This will be a two-part video, though. I will also be breaking down the player props. Now, we are partnered with Monkey Knife fight. They are the single best website to play player props and bring home the revenue. We're about to pay the mortgage with the player props. So I'll be diving into some of my favorite games on their website, monkeyknifefight.com. Later today, we'll be going live on YouTube, but it is for the Patreons only. So Saturdays, we're going to dip in twice. We're going to have this video, which is DFS and player props. Later on in the day, 1 p.m. Eastern time, we will be going live on YouTube. That is for Patreons only, where you can sign up on patreon.com slash BDGE, where you will get the private live stream, my weekly rankings, access to a private forum slash community where myself, Noah, Snacks, and Animal will be answering all of your fantasy football questions. And you will get my waiver wire article. It's an exclusive article. We will not be doing waiver wire videos on the channel, only on Patreon. So patreon.com slash BDGE. Today, DFS, player props, live stream. Let's get it. All right, y'all, let's dive into some player props. First thing you want to do is head over to monkeyknifefight.com. Since a lot of y'all will probably be new here and haven't signed up, you're going to want to log in wherever that is. I'm already logged in, so I'd have to log out. And you deposit your first deposit. If you use promo code BDGE, again, you will get a 100% deposit match up to 50. Start out slow, work your way up. So we're on monkeyknifefight.com. We click new game at the top. And, you know, if you're interested in other sports, they also have football. They have MLB, they, have, they even have WNBA. Man, Monkey Knife Fight is out here eating, eating, really on the grind, huh? All right, so obviously we're going to stick to football because I don't really fuck with the other sports too much. So when you click on football, all of the games will pop up. You have the choice to choose player props and win some moolah from any of the slates on here. What I like to do is kind of choose games. I see maybe the over-under is a little shoddy. I think it's going to overperform. And the first one up on that list is going to be the Houston Texans and the New Orleans Saints. So I'd come down here. I'd also just look overall, like if you have players that you think are going to far outperform um, what the initial projections are, whether that's just public's projections or maybe like the fantasy scoring projections on whatever site you might be using, and that's probably a good game to target. So the first one, I'm going to go to Houston and New Orleans because they're playing on Monday night. And the over-under originally started at, I believe, 51 or 51 and a half since then. It's up to like 53 and a half now, and I think that's going to continue to rise. I think this is going to be like an absolute shootout. Both of these offenses are obviously explosive. Saints going against this defense that lost a lot of players, man. No more Jadavian Clowney, no more Tyron Matthew. Um, they, they lost some other players in free agency. So I, I think this is a team that lost a lot on defense, so the Saints are going to score. But at the same time, they have an explosive offense that's going to need to catch up. So I just imagine this game being very, 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 very high scoring, almost reminiscent to the first game last year where the Saints and the Bucks put up like 8,000 passing yards. So when I'm looking at this game, click on the game, and then there's a lot of options. All the different types of options you could do are at the top here. There's a little scroller that you can choose from. There's even like a show more contests. And depending on which you choose, you'll see the return. So if you put down a dollar, you'll get you know 1.5 in return, 1.79 get up to here you want to get crazy 20x 32x depending on whatever you put in again promo code bdge will get you 100 percent deposit if you throw 20 they'll give you 20 to play with on top of that so what i'd like to do is stick with the fantasy projections um you know if some of you guys think you're better statistically then go for it but all the ones labeled right here where you see the little fantasy points with the little white sticker on the bottom are the ones that i'm pretty much looking at but you can go around it and browse a little bit the over under where you're picking three out of four right here and what that basically does is you have to get three or four correct on here and you're choosing over under so you see for alvin kamara 24 and a half fantasy points deshaun watson 21 and a half drew Brees, 20 and a half d hop 19 and a half so you're saying do i think they're going to go over do i think they're going to go under you can hit the little eye and it'll show you it's very basic scoring four point passing touchdown 25 passing yards is a point, minus one for interception, regular rules otherwise. It is full PPR though, full point per reception. So that's obviously huge when you're talking about guys like D-Hop and Alvin Kamara and the Michael Thomases of the world. So the way I look at it, I think this is going to be a shootout. Kamara is going to smash. 
I think Deshaun Watson actually is going to be closer to his point total than Drew Brees is. I think Drew Brees and the Saints will have absolutely no problem going up and down the field. So I see him throwing in probably three touchdowns along with 300 passing yards, crushing that. Watson, I think, is going to be a little bit closer. I think this defense on the Saints side is, you know, pretty good. They get a pretty good pass rush. And they did add Tunsil on the Texans offensive line, but there still might be a lot of pressure under there. I would say I would project him for maybe 275 passing yards, two touchdowns, and I think he gets over that 21 and a half point mark with the rushing. I think he adds maybe 35, 40 rushing yards. So I think he goes over. I just think this is a smash spot for everybody. So I'm just going to nail the over on all of them. All you have to do is get three out of four correct. And since, you know, it's multiple teams, you're kind of diversifying the revenue. You're not all banking on one team. And if something goes south there, you know, you're going to go south. You just need three out of four. So D-Hop could struggle and Watson goes off and you're still good there as long as obviously Breeze and Kamara goes off. In full point PPR, I don't see a way that Kamara, you know, disappoints here. Even that is, that is a very high point total, of course. Then you come down here, you could choose how much you want to bet, right? $2, $5. And it says what your prizes are based on what the prize multiplicate, mul multiplicator, multiplication, I don't fucking know. Multiplier. There we go. 2.3x. So whatever you bet, you're going to win 2.3 times that amount, obviously, plus your buy-in back. So if we throw 10 bucks on it, we're going to win 23, get the $10 back. And it's as simple as that. So that is my favorite stack right there. The Kamara, Watson, Breeze, Hopkins, all over because I love this game to go over. But again, you can go kind of mess around and see what other player prop games they got going on here. You can go four or five. They added Michael Thomas and it's more statistic. Rushing yards over 69 for sure. Watson. Ooh, that's exactly what I projected him at. I'm going to go over for Breeze. I'm going to go over for him. Receiving yards over. I'm actually going to go under with Deshaun Watson here. And that would be my other one. That's 3.44x the prizes. So if we bet 10, we're going to win 34. It's just a lot of fun, obviously. It makes uh, watching the game exciting. So I'm going to be hammering the Houston and New Orleans game. The other game, I'm going to try to do this quickly so I don't make you sit here for 17 hours, but hopefully you get some good player analysis from that as well. If you do enjoy the video, if you are enjoying the video, of course, just hit that thumbs up button. And comment down below what your favorite player props are once you go check it out on Monkey Knife Fight. And of course, supporting me would, you could do that by using my promo code. Helps me out a little bit on the back end. Second game I'm really intrigued by is Baltimore versus Miami. I think, like, I understand Ryan Fitzpatrick is like a gunslinger, but I think he's really going to struggle. I don't even, even if he throws the ball 38 times, here's the thing, like, in order for Ryan Fitzpatrick to succeed, succeed statistically, one, he's going to have to keep drives alive, two, like, this offense is going to run the ball a ton. So they're going to eat up a lot of clock. There's not going to be a lot of drives for Miami because Miami has a bad defense. Baltimore, even if they don't have a good offense, are still going to consume tons of clock just by running the ball between Lamar Jackson, Mark Ingram, Gus Edwards, Justice Hill. So I don't think Miami is going to have a lot of time of possession to rack up statistics. Secondly, when they do have the ball, like the Ravens' defense is awesome. They're going to shut down the Miami offense, which again, has like no playmakers. So um, I like this first one right out of the gate. I like under 236 passing yards for Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I actually like over 182. Um, I know Jackson's not a passer, but 182 I think is very reasonable. It's not like they're in cold weather where they're going to have to ground and pound the whole time. Uh, I, I think I think he puts a couple of big completions together. I think he comes out kind of firing a little bit, and I think he surprises us in week one in a juicy matchup. So I like the under here, the over here. You do have to go two out of two correct. Um, when you're looking through the game options on the top, it says how many you have to get correct. So like rapid fire here two of two. Um, when you go over the over-unders, it's three of four. So I actually like the over-unders here um, for some of the games in regards to Miami uh, Baltimore. So I think uh, Lamar Jackson is going to crush 18 and a half fantasy points. I think Mark Ingram, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Mark Ingram, but this is like, this is literally like, you might want to hold on to Mark Ingram throw him in for this game and then sell him high right after that. Because I mean, the Miami run defense is really, 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 really not good. And Mark Ingram should get like right out of the gate, he should get at least like 15 to 18 carries first game. And a lot of like a lot of you guys will listen to my preseason analysis and be like, oh, I hate players all the time. But no, a lot of the times the players that I like or dislike, sometimes will start off slow and then get going or the verse reverse side, a lot of the guys like Ingram, Freeman, Gurley, Fournette also will get big workloads in the beginning because they're set up in a great spot. But I think eventually they will fall into running back by committees or get hurt or etc. So a lot of the guys that I don't like will start off hot out of the gate. And I like to take advantage of that. So we have Mark Ingram, 13 and a half. All he has to do is get in for a touchdown and he's probably hitting that because again, this is full PPR. So if he gets one rushing touchdown, he catches two passes. All he needs to do is go for like 40 total yards from scrimmage. And I think that's very reasonable. Kenyon Drake still scares me a lot. They're saying that he is going to get a big workload in the first game. And uh, I'm going to roll with the over here because it's so low and it is full PPR. So I could see Kenyon Drake getting like four to five catches garbage time, even if it only adds up to like 25, 30 receiving yards. 
So if he catches four or five balls, 20, 20, 30 receiving yards, he just needs to add on like 30 rushing yards. So I do think it's going to be close, even though it seems like it's, uh, you know, it, it's a smash over. That kind of scares me. Ryan Fitzpatrick, the over-under. So this one is probably going to be close. I'm actually going to take the under, believe it or not. I think he's going to end up throwing like 190 to 200 passing yards. He'll probably get in the end zone once or twice, but I do think he throw. I, I think he gets sacked a few times, might get strip sacked and lose a fumble and or throw multiple interceptions. So I think the turnovers that are going to happen in this game are going to inadvertently make Fitzpatrick's fantasy points hit that under. So again, you only have to hit three out of four of this and it's 2.1x your money. So you could throw on whatever you want. And you know, you just throw in 10 bucks, 20 bucks and do a bunch of like two point teasers and see how you do. But just get your feet wet. Obviously, this is week one. This is actually the first time I'm playing. So I'm interested to see how my picks do. Hopefully you guys got a little bit of value out of this. Go sign up on monkeyknifefight.com. Use promo code BDGE and you will get a 100% deposit match. So let's jump over to the DFS section of the video with your man's Joe Holka. All right, we're going to segue into the DFS section of today's episode. As promised, we have Joe Holka on the channel coming back to talk specifically about DFS because, as I mentioned, I don't, I don't really do that, but he does. This is his specialty. Um, if you want to get exclusive content from him, you can always check him out on his YouTube channel linked down below. He does uh, a live stream on Twitch every Sunday morning before kickoff at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So you can go join him there if you got any Q&As for your lineups. And you can find him on all the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, by searching Joe Holka. What's good, Joe? Welcome back to the headquarters. Nick, what's going on, man? Uh, always willing to kind of collaborate with uh, people that are doing content the right way. So I love what you're building here. Uh, I think it'll be awesome to kind of do some uh, collaboration with our channels. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on. And Joe will be here every week talking DFS. Now, I didn't really know how to prepare for the show because I am not really in the grit when it comes to strategies for DFS and the different types of lineups and stuff. So, big dogs, I need y'all to let me know or let me and Joe know what you guys find most valuable when it comes to the DFS space. Like, obviously, we can go back and forth doing player analysis. That's a lot of season-long stuff. Do you want to hear more strategy? Are you cash versus GPP? Like, things like that. Anything that you could think of that you would find valuable drop a comment down below letting us know and we'll start to kind of uh, adapt our show week over week to the things that you guys like the most. For this first week, we're going to kind of navigate position by position and Joe's going to break down some of the guys he likes, some of the guys he don't like, um, and just more general strategy about the position. So I'm going to hand over the microphone to you, Joe, and uh, do your thing, man. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting week, right? I can't believe it's week one already. Uh, I know most of your, your audience is probably in the season-long niche, but DFS is something that's a lot of fun, uh, especially like kind of halfway through the season. Like I feel like it happens every year in season-long, like you either run into injuries on a few teams or maybe just things aren't going your way from your draft. At least with DFS, you have a chance to just build a new lineup every week or a new kind of grouping of lineups. I, I've been doing a, an actual DFS league with some of my buddies as well, in addition to our season-long league that's been – a lot of fun. Uh, DraftKings makes that super easy. But uh, this week in general, I was I was just telling Nick uh, before we jumped on, we're still waiting for for uh, some actual data points. I think there's still a lot of uh, we think we know a lot, but maybe we don't know a ton yet. Um, but in DFS, there there's ways to kind of leverage that based on ownership, um, and that's kind of how you get to the top of GPPs is with a a few lower owned plays, but also mixing in some chalky, more popular plays as well. And there's there's good ways to do that at each position. So we'll mix in a little bit of strategy along the way um, just from kind of a, a granule like broad perspective the first thing that i'm looking for in dfs is good situations to attack on a game level so i'm looking at things like pace and also offensive line versus defensive line because offensive lines um, if that's one of the things that's going to really affect a quarterback's efficiency we're always looking for efficiency over volume at the quarterback position so some of the games that i expect to be up in pace. Um, the number one game probably from a plays perspective is San Francisco and Tampa Bay. Uh, so it's probably uh, the leading candidate, honestly. It's, it's them and everyone else as far as pace is concerned. Uh, so they're going to be pretty popular, especially the Tampa Bay side. San Francisco allowed the 10th most plays last year and the Bucks games as a whole, seventh most combined snaps last season. So definitely think that there's going to be a good amount. And that's even before you get into the Bruce Arians things, the Cardinals actually most recently, the Bruce Arians Cardinals uh, second and fifth in pace uh, over the, his last two seasons. So I definitely think that this game is going to be um, high scoring, um, but Vegas is kind of lined uh, up with that as well. So what you'll see with a lot of players earlier in the season is really just following Vegas lines of some of the top implied totals would be some of the highest owned players. 
Um, and, and I do think that that's generally something that we want to look at with Vegas lines, but also this time of year, there's value in kind of going to that next tier as well, um, because it could be those games uh, just outside that top tier that end up being the highest scoring. Cause like I said, we really don't know a ton yet. Uh, so the second game that I least want to talk about before we jump in to positions, uh, Kansas city chiefs at Jacksonville Jacks wires. Uh, so basically um, chiefs games again, uh, averaged a third most combined snaps last year. So we know how efficient the Chiefs were because they were just scoring touchdowns at will at that point. Um, but I honestly think if the Jaguars can kind of hang in there this week, at least a little bit, they're only four-point underdogs the last I looked at it earlier today. Um, that's going to force Kansas City to have to pass a little bit more. So anytime there's a pass, uh, anytime there's more passing, there's more incomplete passes, which means the clock's going to stop, right? So there could be more plays in this game. Uh, so I'm interested in that. Kansas City's opponents ran the second most plays Per game last year so I think there's some interesting cheaper pieces on Jacksonville which we'll talk about um, and then the third game I'll talk about and then I'll move into to quarterback uh, the LA Rams versus Carolina Panthers so uh, Sean McVay his last two seasons in LA the Rams finished first and third in neutral snaps so um, they're a team that is very efficient but they also uh, run a ton of plays uh, fourth most plays per game last year they also pass at the 12th highest rate. So again, incomplete passes, more plays. It's a good thing for DFS. You're, you're attacking volume at almost every position. So um, that'll be another game I'm looking to possibly stack. But as far as the quarterback side of things, um, just kind of circling back um, to that top game that we talked about, Jameis Winston, um, he's 7,500 on FanDuel. On DraftKings, he's a pretty similar level as well. Uh, but he's, he's at home, um, third highest over under on the main slate. And what we really want at quarterback is tight spreads because we want a back and forth passing game. So uh, this spread uh, was only at one point uh, the last I looked at it again earlier today. Um, both teams finished uh, in, in the bottom three in fantasy points per pass attempt allowed. So really like Winston quite a bit. Um, if you wanted to go down, another thing that's really important, obviously it's important in season long as well, is really trying to get rushing quarterback so Kyler Murray Lamar Jackson are guys that I'm targeting at DFS this week for sure um, I'm a little bit more concerned with Lamar Jackson because I think there's definitely some blow up uh, factor blow out factor in that game um, you never know how much they're just going to kind of take the air out of the ball when they do get up and I do expect them uh, to get up in this game for sure so um, that's an interesting one um, Kyler Murray it, it's another situation where I think that's one of the games that I'm a little bit worried about the pace because we know that Arizona is going to be picking up the pace a ton in comparison to last year, but Detroit is really, uh, they're just going to try and run the ball and kill the clock. That's just kind of what they do. Um, they kind of an old school um, ground and pound uh, establish the run type team. So I'm a little bit, I think the Cardinals are going to be a team we're attacking a ton this year. I'm just not sure if it's going to be uh, week one, but I think he's at least in play. Um, and then if we just move down a little bit, uh, I do think that, uh, Jacoby Brissett, uh, he's extremely cheap on DraftKings. Um, it's interesting because I mentioned one of the things that's really important to me is a strong offensive line because it really spikes uh, QB efficiency. Uh, he is only 6K on FanDuel. On DraftKings, you get a significant price discount on him as well. So in cash games, paying down a quarterback does make a lot of sense at times. He's 4,400 in comparison um, to some of the other quarterbacks. So 4,400, let's just take – Mahomes out of it. Mahomes is 7,200 on a class of his own, but Winston 6,600, you get an extra 2K in savings if you're willing to go down at quarterback. Um, so that's something I do like to do at times in cash games, just to jam in as much running back value as possible. Um, I'm throwing a lot at you, Nick. Any questions so far? No, I'm just trying to capture as much as I possibly can. I think a lot of this goes back to, you know, me answering like six star questions and pace and snaps you mentioned being like super important. I think that's so undervalued in the season long space because people obviously that are a little more efficient in the DFS space start to pick up on these kind of things. Um, now I'm looking at, you know, you, you mentioned over under a lot and sometimes I guess Vegas will factor in like the pace and the plays and things like that. And I filmed a little bit of a, a, a portion of this video prior to you hopping on talking about different player props. I like, and I was attacking that Monday night game, the Houston versus new Orleans game. Now, I know that actually, like, for as good as an offense like New Orleans is, obviously they run the ball a lot, and they actually – their pace is not that hurry up despite how efficient they are. Yep. But I'm looking at – I'm looking at both of these offenses are, are fantastic, right? We have Breeze leading the team. We have Deshaun Watson leading the team. I think both of them can easily go for 300 yards, 300 passing uh, – three passing touchdowns. And I think, like, this Houston defense takes a big hit, right? They lose Clowney. They lose uh, Tyron Matthew. They lose some other pieces through free agency. So, like, when you're looking at offensive pace – 
that is always the first and foremost thing you're going to do because with, with a game like this sway you, because I do think they're going to crush their over-under has been creeping up from like 51 to 53 or 54. And I think it's going to crush that to be honest with you. Um, and this is the game I would be targeting. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting game because it's not on the main slate as well. So there'll be people that are, will be playing uh, that showdown slate as well. So definitely relevant. Um, but I haven't taken a huge look at that yet. It's because uh, I'm, I'm mostly playing the main slate. That's where the majority of my volume is every week. And, and I should mention to people too, that, um, I'm primarily a one lineup player. I like to go up and play uh, the higher stakes. So you'll see me in the 1500 entry on DraftKings. It's only like 60 people. Um, so I'm not necessarily trying to get to the top of uh, a GPP, like the millionaire maker that has 100,000 people in it, right? Like I'm trying to play these, these higher dollar tournaments um, that have a little bit um, better chance to win, to be completely honest. So even for some of your uh, kind of uh, subscribers, I honestly think that um, smaller field size, so playing against less people is kind of the way to go in DFS these days. I, I'm not a big cash game player. I don't think there's a huge edge in that. Um, but I honestly am not that into kind of the lottery ticket of these uh, massive tournaments as well. So I wanted to touch on that. But yeah, just to, what, you, what you said about um, kind of that side of things that the team that I struggled with a little bit last year um, are these like efficiency, like really high efficiency teams that aren't kind of um, super fast pace so like uh, New Orleans is a tough one because they're they're such a good offensive team as far as their scheme and they score a lot of points but they they don't typically run a lot of plays so um, there's a lot to go wrong I think th uh, there's there's something that to be said for high equity touches as well I know we've had conversations in the offseason about Alvin Kamara and how his his touches are so valuable in comparison to um, if you're going to get four or five more touches from someone like Saquon Barkley that's what I'm more talking from a se season-long perspective in DFS the volume is by far the most important thing. Uh, but the, in terms of the Vegas lines, um, I do think that um, they have almost, honestly more information on what type of sharp money is coming in anyway. So I'm paying attention to, yeah, like the implied totals, which games we think are going to be high scoring, but also the line movement, see how much money is coming in on one side. Because if we see a lot of money coming in on the over, uh, a lot of times that'll be a good spot uh, if that line has moved significantly over the week to, to kind of go overweight. So I kind of tiptoed around your question a little bit, but I'm sure we'll get into to more of the, the Vegas stuff as we go. No, no, you hit on a lot of good stuff. And just for people out there that are semi new to gambling, a lot of the times what happens is the lines will move if it's at 51 or 51 and a half and you see it start to creep up to 52 and a half, 53 and a half. They're asking people to start betting the under, which means they have a lot of money going on the over and typically common sense would tell you that that's the sharp money. There's people with big money to spend that know what they're doing will slam the over, meaning that that's probably a good bet. So Vegas pushes the line up, meaning it wants the rest of the public to start betting on the under. So when you see like the reverse line movements, those are games that you should probably start attacking. So we talked about quarterbacks yep. and I know like from a season long perspective, I would always be looking to pay down a quarterback and I don't really know how, how that plays Very similar. too much. Okay, that makes sense because I, I feel like there's always the, the only uh, exception to that, uh, not to cut you off, but uh, the only exception to that is weeks where we have a lot of salary to to kind of spend. Uh, DraftKings pricing used to be a lot different. It used to be extremely spread out, like like it, well, like it is this week. Honestly, we, we have Brissett all the way down to forty four hundred and, oh. and uh, Mahomes at seventy two hundred. Last year, it was so condensed that you could honestly get up to like a, a Patrick Mahomes relatively easy in some weeks and really not have to pay much salary. So it depends on how tightly clustered the, the salaries are. Um, more often than not paying up at running back, which I'm sure is a big priority for you in, in season long as well, of course. Yeah, it, it seems like I, you almost have to pay up for running back. I would say that might be a little bit different in week one, though, because there's so many value plays out there because there's a lot of guys that maybe might be working their way into the depth chart or might just take over a role because someone's injured to start the season. And there might be values at like, I'm not really sure of the pricing, but maybe like 3000 4000 or something like that, that allows you to pay up for, I mean, I wouldn't pay up for Mahomes this week, given that sure. it's against Jacksonville and it was one of his worst matchups. But like in a normal, typical week, when you get, say, Zeke had sat, like sat out, Tony Pollard sitting there for $4,000, seems like he's someone you have to play. So for this week one slate, are you, uh, are you paying up for running back or are there any values on the slate that you're kind of in love with? Yeah, I mean, I, I pay up for running back uh, almost all the time, but kind of what you're saying, there are some guys that we expect to have significant roles that are priced down a little bit. Uh, Dalvin Cook, especially after the news with Stefan Diggs being banged up, he's only 6K, um, which relative to someone like Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley is at, at 9K on drafting. So you do get a, a huge savings going down to Cook with at least one of your three spot, spots. I will, I will tell people too, if it's your first time playing DFS, it's almost always uh, your flex is almost always a running back. So you're looking at three guys in each lineup. Uh, Dalvin Cook, he might even push 40% ownership this week. That's how underpriced he is. 
Um, I do think that in that range, a lot of people are on Nick Chubb at 6,700. Um, it depends on what you're going for. Honestly, at wide receiver, there's a lot of nice value as well. Um, so my top running back, uh, I guess unsurprisingly, is still Christian McCaffrey at 8,800. He's number one in my model. Um, and I, I do think that he's still a guy that you want to target floor and ceiling in DFS to get to the top of a tournament. But I still think that some of these elite running backs are underpriced relative to their value because you're basically getting wide receiver one volume in addition to whatever it is, 17, 18 carries, right? So um, I still think these guys are underpriced. Um, I'll have uh, one of Saquon uh, and McCaffrey in my lineups almost every week. I do think this week in particular, guys like Dalvin Cook make a ton of spent, uh, sense, especially against the Falcons defense, uh, 28th against running backs in the passing game last year. Um, so that's one of the stats that I do look at quite a bit at Football Outsiders. I, I want to target teams like that that are fully fine just giving me up these like under like kind of under the radar throws, these low A dot throws that um, and PPR scoring on DraftKings is extremely valuable. Uh, Leonard Fournette's an interesting one in his price range as kind of a pivot off of those guys in tournaments just because I, I think that the way we saw him use in the preseason uh, was encouraging, just that he was used a little bit more in the passing game. I did mention that uh, that game we expect to be extremely high paced in KC, right? So I think that um, Fournette's an interesting volume play that might be a little bit under own um, relative to some of these other guys, uh, especially. I think that if you think he's going to be game script independent, um, I think that that's an interesting game to attack, kind of back your way into some KC exposure there with a, a nice correlation play. Um, as far as that, Chris Carson's going to be extremely popular. Um, I'm not on guys like that. Uh, I don't really play guys in DFS that uh, I think are basically a zero in the passing game. Um, a lot of people disagree with me because they think he's just simply underpriced. Um, but again, I think it's an opportunity cost thing at running back. I just don't want to give up uh, a running back slot to a guy that I don't think has a massive ceiling. Like, yeah, Chris Carson's 5,700, but I'm playing Dalvin Cook at 6K over him every single time just because right. of the involvement in the passing game. So regardless of the results, I still feel like that's right. Um, but Carson's going to be popular just because of how many touches he's probably going to get. On yeah, the I, feel like, that price I feel like with Carson, a guy like that, I totally get you because I mean, we haven't seen him do it in the passing game yet. Mm -hmm. It's like he's just as likely to put up, you know, 16, 17, 18 fantasy points as just about anybody else. But he almost has a 0% shot of going for that 27, 28, 30-point game that a Dalvin Cook can do. I'm so with you on Dalvin Cook. He's, uh, I think he's like my RB4 or 5 this week in my season-long rankings. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Like the Falcons' defense, their scheme is allowing running backs to get those short passes. And it's year over year over year over year. It's like we brought in Dan Quinn three years ago to, you know, make this defense better. We haven't had a pass rush, a pass rush in three years. It, we've allowed these, these receptions to the running backs year over year over year. It's, it's not like a fluky thing. I'm all in on Dalvin Cook, especially if he's at a cheap price. And I'm, I'm kind of in on C-Mac, too. Because I imagine Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald just rushing up the middle every time. Cam possibly limited by the foot, looking to dump it off almost every single play. So I, I think Christian McCaffrey comes away from this game with like seven or eight receptions. And it's an interesting take on Fournette because Fournette's a guy that I wanted absolutely no part of in season long because I yep. just I just don't imagine him being durable and staying on the field for the entire year. Don't However, have to worry about him in DFS. Exactly. And that's, yep. that's the thing. Early season targets, right? These are guys that I would be looking to trade low if I drafted them or trade yep. high. I drafted them because you're not worrying about the injuries like these are guys who are set up to have big workloads in the beginning but my my analysis against them you know it's the Leonard Fournette's it's the DeFonta Freeman's it's the uh, Todd Gurley's oh, yeah. or whatever yeah it's like six eight weeks into the season is where I imagine their downfall will be so I do imagine them getting big workloads starting off hot but they're not going to be guys that win you your season long on the flip side though like Leonard Fournette if he got 27 touches in this game that wouldn't surprise me whatsoever but do I think he's going to stay on the field for the full 16 game no but those are guys that you know despite me talking about how I don't like them most of the time they're they're different the analysis for them is different in DFS especially towards the beginning of the season so 100 yeah, percent, yeah and I'm actually curious what your thoughts are on Gurley because I've gone back and forth on him a little bit this week I, I feel like there's a chance that maybe McVay gets trolls everyone and and just trots him out there and he scores three touchdowns in the first week um, but I mean, obviously there's a chance that he's not going to see near the workload that we're kind of picturing when we think of like kind of mid season girly last year. Um, so I, I'm going back and forth on him cause he's, his projected ownership is significantly lower than any of these other guys we've talked about. Um, and I do kind of, I, I want to find ways to get into that Carolina game. I'm just not quite sure how I'm going to do it yet. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, man. I, I, it's like, I will also want to get in that, in that game. Like I want season long pieces playing during that game. I just can't figure out who I want. I think the two guys I would attack or the two guys I own a lot of in season long is Brandon Cooks and Robert Woods. I don't think this, this Panthers pass defense is really like yeah. anything special. So I think they'll eat that way. 
Uh, I'm going to need to see it before I do anything when it comes to Gurley. Like, he's not going to be in my lineup. I just think, like, you hear a lot of the analysis, like, oh, if he puts up 75% of the production he did last year, then he'll be in RB8 or whatever, right? Yeah. The problem with that is, like, once the knee acts up and it's arthritis, so it's basically a given that at one point or another he's going to have to get these shots or it's going to flame up. Then it's like, what happens? Like, yes, the end of season numbers might give you 250 touches, 1,300 yards from scrimmage and 10 touchdowns. However, you don't know what week is going to be the five touch game and then the 17th yep. touch game. Well, that, that's what makes him untouchable in cash games this week because wow. his price, he's 7,900. Just as a little bit of a comparison there, you can get guys like David Johnson at 7,700, Le'Veon Bell at 7,100. We already talked about Chubb and at 6,400 and Cook at 6K. So it's like you can't touch him in cash games. He's going to be under owned in tournaments for sure. I'd be shocked if he made it to 15% in the, in the Millie, but uh, people were burned by him quite a bit last year. So I still think there's a little bit of recency bias there, um, but that's going to be one that's interesting to watch. Uh, before we move on from, from running back, I, I'm interested in your take on, on carry on Johnson. I, I, he's, he's popping as like a decent value for me at 5,800 right now um, against the Cardinals. I feel like we should be targeting teams again, that are playing against the Cardinals just because of that defense is so terrible and they're going to be playing a high pace. I guess I get nervous with Detroit. Uh, I guess I like, don't play those guys very often uh, in general. So what, what do you think of carry on? Uh, I think if I made multiple lineups like BFS wise, I'd probably yeah. throw them in uh, a, a couple of them. I love carry on as like, as like a player, but obviously the whole Matt Patricia thing just – Right. You just can't ever feel good about it. Like, that's the problem. But I do like I, – I, I, I hate the Arizona offense right now. Like, I hate what we saw from them in the preseason. And I think that, like, Detroit – you buy into them just, like, holding out, like, their actual uh, offense? Or you think uh, that people are just, like, kind of trying to play up that Aaron because that's what they want to see? I think, I, I think they're, they're not being objective about the situation. Like, I yeah, love yeah. – you know, I wanted to see Christian Kirk. I wanted to see Kyler Murray. I wanted to see David Johnson succeed. But, like, at the end of the day – they're not making up fake plays in the preseason. I understand like maybe the pace is a little bit down, but every single play, the D line was in the backfield, just absolutely dominating David Johnson. We didn't see David Johnson run from the slot at all, which was a little weird because you figured this new offense, they would have him work in on different parts of the field. We yeah. didn't see that. So that's the only thing that maybe makes me like, okay, maybe they held back a little bit, but like, I don't know. We saw absolutely nothing that was positive from them. So to just expect, you know, just if your only notion is that, like, they were hiding everything, they're going to be perfect during the regular season, I think you're going to have another thing coming from you. So, like, I was – as soon as we saw the third preseason game where they were all playing into, the, you know, the second half or whatever, yeah. I was pretty much out on the Cardinals from a season-long perspective. So, like, that's a team I'm definitely – I won't be buying into, like, if I played DFS on a weekly basis until we saw it from them. Uh, carry on, I mean – I don't know. I, I guess it's a gamble. I guess it's kind of risky. Yeah, it's tournament, tournament only for sure. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I'm, I'm still bullish on the Cardinals. I guess don't know if this is the week. Um, I think that the best kind of opportunity will be us talking about them next week. I'm not sure even who they're playing, but um, the best thing to do in DFS is just to kind of uh, when there's blood in the streets, that's, that's when you kind of full stack those guys. So that I'm, I'm more worried about them next week. Probably I'm bullish on, on David Johnson still. I'd like to see his price go down a little bit, at least so we can kind of get a better idea of what his volume is going to be like. Um, so at wide receiver, um, the highest on player, uh, it's pretty clear, is probably going to be Godwin. Uh, he's underpriced. Uh, we know all about his role in Tampa Bay, uh, kind of the Fitzgerald type role in this offense, uh, extremely valuable. Um, so I, I'd be shocked if he wasn't the highest owned uh, wide receiver. He's only 6,200. Him and Tyler Lockett are kind of the guys that I'm uh, kind of locked in on right now in the mid range if I end up there at wide receiver. Um, Adam Thielen at 6,800 is the first guy in my model right now. Uh, probably a lot of to do with his uh, his projection going up and his target share going up with with Stephon Diggs banged up. Uh, so I think that Thielen at 6,800 uh, is an incredible value. Uh, so I think that he'll be a guy that I'll have some exposure to. We know they want to run in Minnesota, um, but I'm not opposed to a condensed target share is still extremely valuable in DFS for sure. That's what made uh, people like Thielen and Diggs so valuable the first half of last year when they actually had the other offensive coordinator that uh, – basically got run, run out of town because he was throwing too much. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm in on him. Uh, I, this whole Tampa Bay offense. So Mike Evans is very high up in my model as well. He's only, he's 7,900. Um, but if we move, make our way down, uh, there's two guys that are cheaper than anyone we've talked about so far um, that I'm on for sure. And at DD Westbrook at 4,800 against KC, uh, I think he's one of the best plays on the slate. Um, if we're trying to save a little bit, um, there was, uh, we try not to get too roped into preseason and that sort of thing, but he did show a little bit of chemistry with Foles 
Um, yeah. So Curtis Samuel in that same range, 4,200. Those are the two guys that I really like in the mid range. Uh, so pairing Samuel and uh, Christian McCaffrey together in the same lineup without uh, Cam, I, I still think it's fine uh, depending on what type of contest you're playing. I, I think that they have uh, slightly different roles. I think you could probably project Samuel for anywhere from like six to seven targets. Um, and at that price, he's, he's just too cheap um, in my opinion. Um, so those are the guys that I'm kind of locked in on um, as of now. Um, at wide receiver, there, there's a few other guys that we could probably uh, at least talk about. Um, so I mentioned Tyler Lockett, in that, but in that same range, uh, Tyler Boyd, um, I, I do think that that role, that Doug Baldwin type role um, for Lockett it is really valuable. But Tyler Boyd, like he's still the number one on the other side of this game. Um, so I, I think that that's interesting. The Seahawks defense, I do think, is going to get a ton of pressure on Cincy just because their offensive line is so poor. And obviously they just got Shadavian Clowney. Uh, mm -hmm. But with A.J. Green out, I, I still think that Boyd's going to get a really nice uh, target share there uh, for his price. Um, I, I go back and find, I've heard some kind of whispers about Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones. Like I said, I, I'm not trying to actively um, get into that game, but we will be trying to play um, players against Arizona. So I think they're at least in play. Um, if Samuel ends up being super popular, which there's just been so much hype on Curtis Samuel all offseason, DJ Moore is interesting, um, especially just because I think he'll come at much lower ownership uh, than Samuel. So that, that entire game is super interesting. But that, that's kind of where I'm at a wide receiver. If you really wanted to go super cheap, um, someone like Michael Gallup, especially if uh, there's anything uh, still to be going on with uh, the foot for um, I'm blanking Amari Cooper. Gosh, uh, long day. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, if Amari Cooper's foot's still um, kind of limiting him at all, I think Gallup's interesting. We, what you want to do in DFS is really target these high value targets, right? So we want um, we want these targets that are, are high air yard situations. Like during the once we get some data behind it, we'll, I'll kind of walk you guys through some of the stats that I think are are super important. Um, but I do think that that type of player uh, makes a ton of sense because they can make your entire day, make your entire lineup on one or two plays, um, and you can get them for really cheap, paying down for the variance at wide receiver in order to kind of pay up for the the safety at running back, basically. Yeah, I honestly think I'm like on par with 90% of the things you said because Lockett and Boyd are guys that I'm, I'm so high on in season long, and I have a lot of shares like end fourth, nice. early, early fifth round guys. My only concern with Lockett this week particularly is, I mean, it's such a good matchup, and he should have like a floor of almost six for 80 yards, right? But like obviously they're going to feed Carson like a madman, and they're going to sure. go up big. They're like a 10-point favorite. So I imagine like game script for Lockett getting out of control, which is why I was going to flip it back and be like, you know, how about Boyd on the other side of things? Yep. The O-line, D-line is definitely a little bit scary, and I could see Dalton getting sacked like five times in this game. But it's it's Boyd there. Like, Boyd, it's Boyd and, and really nobody else, you know? I think I think if you're attacking Lockett, you're basically saying, like, one of two things, right? Like, either you think these guys are connect, going to connect for a big play on one of those opportunities, or you think that the Bengals are going to be able to score enough points that the, the Seahawks are going to have to throw. Um, so both of those things are, are big ifs, honestly, for a lot of the reasons yeah. you just said. And, and for the record, just so everyone knows, I barely ever get Russell Wilson right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> if I'm on Lockett, probably just a, a good time to fade him and get on him next week. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Um, I kind of like the Marvin Jones point, though. I, I'm, I'm in on Jones over Galladay. Okay, I mean, let's hear it. He's cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're going It's very back, similar. Let's it's, see. Okay. Yeah, I'll, check, I'll check again. Go if go you're ahead. going back to last year, if you're looking at – Stafford down by the red zone it was Jones dominating in the beginning of the season once he once he went out like week 10 or so that's when Galladay started getting the touchdown targets he still didn't really produce at a high touchdown rate but then I'm watching this preseason when the first team guys are on the field and again I don't really care about the stats but when they were in the red zone it was to Jones it yeah. was Jones every single time and they didn't end up connecting it was one was an overthrow one was like a pass interference penalty but it seemed like he went right back to Jones because Jones is what he knows down there so the way I look at it, I think Jones – I'm still a fan of Jones from a season long, from any kind of perspective. Yeah. I still think he's a very good uh, wide receiver. He's still – he's not, like, that old, and he's not coming off that serious of an injury. So he looks to be good to go. He's got a ton of, ton of history and chemistry with Matt Stafford, which is why I'm kind of higher on him than I am Galladay, at least from a week one perspective, because obviously the Cardinals are going to be without Patrick Peterson. They're going to be without Robert Alford for the first week, and this yeah. is going to be a shit show. So if I'm taking one of the two, it's going to be Marvin Jones, because he's also likely going to get – Whatever the oh, is like, that. I love it. He's significantly cheaper too. So Galladay is a sixty three hundred on DraftKings. Marvin Jones is forty eight hundred. And guess who else is forty eight hundred? Dee Dee Westbrook. So like a pure like leverage play, honestly, because you'll get Marvin Jones sub ten percent. Dee Dee is going to be close to twenty. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what you're looking for in tournaments, right? So like a position like wide receiver with someone with, with upside, like we know Marvin Jones is a good player and he has upside. So especially in this matchup, yeah, I, I have no problem with that. Yeah, I, I put his chances of getting in the end zone like pretty high if they get some red zone opportunities, which they should because his defense is, is porous. And uh, Gallup, I'm with you on Gallup too. I actually like right before kickoff last night, I'm in like a deep league where we have to start like three wide receivers, three yeah. plus plays. Last minute, I threw Gallup in over Geronimo Allison. Obviously, I'm happy about that. My right. thing is, just like, you know, we don't know what we're going to get from Gallup. He could come out and go, like, two for 29, for all we know. But Cooper's foot really fucking terrifies me because I know he came back to a full practice, but there right. were reports he was saying, like, he talked to the media after. He's like, yeah, there was just a couple things I couldn't do at, like, 100%, like, cut and plant off the foot. I'm like, bro, we're, like, four days away from, like, the NFL season kicking off, and you can't do that. That is a glaring red flag to me. It seems so, suboptimal not to be able to plant your foot. Yeah, I'm like, dude, like, this is, like, way bigger of a deal than people are making it out to be. So, Cooper, if he's hampered at all, like, Gallup is easily the next guy up in that lineup, even with Zeke back. And, you know, they're going to run the ball a lot, of course, because that's just the history of their offense. But, I mean, if someone's going to eat outside of Cooper, it's got to be Gallup. So, I like him as, like, a low uh, money play that, I mean, maybe he'll be a little bit highly owned. I'm not really sure of the percentages, but I'm sure he's not, like, a super popular yeah player. no he's not going to be super popular and in, in that range though like in, in dfs like it's not going to kill you if he puts up like seven or eight points you know what i mean like you're, you're fine at that because it allowed you to get up to things in other uh parts of your lineup so one of those guys that you could get up to this is a, a pro transition uh travis kelsey uh, 7100 is so expensive for a tight end but it's probably worth it uh the other thing about tight end that's a little bit different already this year Last year, you could get Kelsey in, like, the 6,300 range. So, like, in comparison to wide receivers, that's yeah. well below all the wide receiver ones. Um, so, he was underpriced most of the season. Same thing with Kittle um, and Ertz for the, for the same kind of reason. So, I'm a little bit nervous about Kelsey at 7,100. I love it in tournaments. I just don't know if there's going to be a ton of leverage there. He's probably going to be around 17%, 20% around that range, if I had to guess. Yeah. Um, but if you're paying down at wide receiver and you pay all the way down at quarterback still – you could still get in Kelsey and feel pretty good about like taking care of the position where there's just so much opportunity cost from the top and the bottom. Like we'll talk about some of these other guys that make some sense further down. Um, but I'm interested in at least uh, seeing where roster construction leads me with some Kelsey teams. Um, so I'm in on that. Um, if you move down OJ Howard. So if everyone's playing Godwin, if everyone's playing Mike Evans, uh, I'm interested in OJ Howard. He's 5k. He's probably a little bit too expensive, which is why uh, he makes sense in tournaments because he's going to be lower on. Um, but one thing, and I like to tell this story too, uh, two years ago, um, the, the millionaire maker winning team uh, was a, uh, Doug Baldwin was massively popular that week, but the team that won the millionaire maker was Russell Wilson and like four other pass catchers on the, on the Seahawks. Um, so anytime there's someone that's super popular, like Godwin this week in Tampa Bay, it makes sense to maybe fade Godwin on a team with, and maybe play Winston Evans Howard, something like that. So you're, if you don't, you don't luck into the touchdowns with Godwin and you get them on these lower own pieces around them, it, it's a really good way to gain leverage in roster construction. So I'm in on that. Um, Kittle is interesting on the other side of this game for sure. 6,600, super expensive. I think most people, they're going to go up. They're going to go all the way up to Kelsey. Um, but I'm, I'm in on like those top guys. Uh, if, if we want to move down a little bit, Hunter Henry at 3,900 is a great value. He's probably the best value on the slate. I would expect him to be uh, pretty heavily owned in cash games, but it, tight end is never really a position where there's, you really have to worry too much about ownership because it's, it's not condensed very high um, unless there's just a, uh, an insane value. I, I do think that, that Hunter Henry, like with, there's going to be targets up for grabs uh, without Melvin Gordon. Um, there's no more Tyrell Williams, no more Antonio Gates. So I think it's interesting um, from a season long and a DFS perspective, uh, Hunter Henry, I kind of want to be early on a guy like that. Right. But if he ends up being like that primary red zone, option uh, i'm interested in that uh the biggest thing at tight end um is that you really want um high team totals to kind of circle back to the vegas point um because we need touchdowns right so if we're looking purely at a one game um scenario we really want to attack these teams that we think are going to score points pace and all that is extremely important as well um but we want high team totals and, and more often than not they're going to be um home tight ends um but also um, it's that, and then it's also routes run. Um, so a predictive stat for tight ends is, is routes run per game. Um, so it's so much different than wide receiver because wide receiver, um, they're going to get many, uh, many more opportunities. Um, but if you at least know that your tight end, your cheaper tight end, whatever it is, is out there running routes in good situations. Like you mentioned, Marvin Jones in the preseason was, mm -hmm. was running a ton of routes in the red zone. Something you want to look for at tight end as well. And it's kind of how you can find um, some value at times uh, at the way cheaper end of things. 
Okay, let me bounce off two of the points you named at the end there, the two yeah. like predictive or very important things for tight ends. You mentioned at home, and this is something I talk about a lot, like anytime I'm streaming some something, whether it's a defense, whether it's a quarterback too, if it's like a tiebreaker, it might even be more important than a tiebreaker. I always, always, always look for teams that are at home. Yeah. Like quarterbacks play and teams just play so much better. And like a lot of people kind of think that's, you know, not a tangible piece of evidence or like oh, the data supports exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I, I would think so. They just play so much better. So that makes sense that obviously that would trickle over to the tight ends. Now, what about a guy like you say, like routes run is super important. That just makes sense, right? Because you have more opportunity in the passing game and that's not like an easily accessible stat for the public. So they're not sure. going to know, they're not going to know snap percentage even to begin with. So to even trickle it down further to a place like routes run. Um, first of all, what about a guy like Mark Andrews, who people are really excited about? Um, he is playing against the Dolphins, so this is a good matchup for him. However, this preseason, we're still seeing him in a big committee with Nick Boyle, with Hayden Hurst. He's on the field for like 35% of the overall snaps. Right. But it seems like he might be the receiving tight end here. Are you like, is he just like too much of a risk or a gamble, or just like you have no idea what you're getting from him that you're probably going to fade a guy like that? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a really good point. Um, he's the kind of guy that I'm I'm picturing, right? Like the guy that is, yeah, he's not a blocking tight end when he's out there. He's running routes. That, that's yeah. something that you have to pay attention to. Um, in terms of, in terms of him in particular, I'm more worried about this game getting out of hand, and maybe they don't throw the ball a ton anyway. But at the same time, Lamar doesn't really throw to anyone, but for some reason he throws to Mark Andrews. So um, he's only like I believe he's three k. So I mean, he's he's extremely cheap uh he's the fifth rated guy in my model so extremely high um he's only projected for two to four percent ownership um so yeah he's a great leverage play especially uh if you end up with the team a uh, lamar team um it's interesting though so you mentioned routes run the only way you get that is from a site like pro football focus um yeah, but i get I, I was gonna ask where you yeah yeah, yeah so i get but i guess a uh, shameless plug um so my twitch subscribers so if you have amazon prime it's free if you don't have Amazon Prime, it's five bucks. Um, you actually get access to my data sheet. So everything that I think that is extremely important at each position, I give to my uh, my, my Twitch subscribers in our Discord chat. So um, you'll get the routes run that way if you don't want to pony up for, for PFF and just please don't tell anyone. <laughs> That's what I've been saying for the longest time. And I'm like, shit, someone's eventually going to find out that I'm just giving off all the PFF stats and stuff. Yeah. That was going to be my next question, like where you got that from? Because the only place I've seen it was like their premium stats or whatever. And I wish yeah, it so if you can use it for wide receiver too, because uh, one of the best stats for wide receiver is yards per route run. So yeah. that's one of the, that's, I'm sure you know all about that, but that's one yeah, of the ones yeah. on my sheet as well. Yeah. I've been telling people about that too. I mean, it not only tells you that they're like commanding targets, but they're doing stuff with the targets. So I think that's yep. one of the most predictive statistics of course. Um, let me ask you one more question about the tight end position. Sure. Like, when you're paying up for a guy like Kelsey or like Kittle seems obviously in a bomb matchup too, but maybe doesn't have, you know, just the, the floor, maybe that a guy like Kelsey has. When you're paying up for an expensive tight end like that, because I'd imagine myself like working through like really stupidly, like working through all the positions and then being at the tight end and being like, oh shit, I have like 3,400 left. So this is what I'm going to have to do. If you're going to go, like, you know, you're going to do Kelsey, you know, you're going to grab Kittle. Do you start your roster construction with those guys and then work backwards? So I actually, I'll put in what I think are the best values at each position first. Okay. Um, so, and that's not, not including running back because typically I don't go super value at running back. So I'll put in the cheapest tight end um, that I'm willing to play uh, this week. That's Jeff Swain. Uh, he's 2,900 against mm -hmm. KC. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to end up playing Jeff Swain, but he's probably going to be like my placeholder lineup as I'm building. And then I'm going to go to wide receiver and I'm going to try and figure out who of those really cheap guys I like, whether it's D.D. Westbrook at 4,800, throw him in. And then I'll throw in uh, – who's someone else that's super cheap? Let's throw in your boy Marvin Jones, like two of those guys. Um, and then if you really wanted to get crazy, throw in like someone like Cole Beasley, who's also super cheap, uh, 3,600. Uh, I love Josh Allen too, by the way. He's just great for fantasy because all he does is run and throw deep. But um, if you think he's going to check down a little bit more, Cole Beasley makes some sense just because of how cheap he is. Um, so I'll throw in like those wide receivers. I'll throw in the cheapest quarterback. So Jacoby Brissett um, that I'm willing to play. And then uh, I'll, tr I'll honestly, the next thing I usually do is put in my favorite three running backs that run the three running backs that I think are going to see the most volume and, and be in the best position to reach their ceiling. So say I'll put in McCaffrey, Dalvin cook, and this is just an example. Um, and let's throw in, um, let's just throw in David Johnson for sake of argument. Cause those are pretty expensive guys. And then I'll basically see, 
what I want to upgrade from there. Uh, same thing with defense. So I'll just play a cheaper defense. We can talk about that in a minute, but that's kind of how I like to build and, and I'll upgrade the team, the positions I think are most important first. And if I can actively upgrade to something like Kelsey at tight end in a way that makes more sense and upgrading at wide receiver, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I just, uh, I'm so new to this that like building yeah. class is so interesting. Um, and I feel like, my, I mean, I've done it. Obviously I've played DFS like, you know, 18 times in my life or whatever, but I've never actually sat down and like, this is how I should do it. I've always been like, Oh, I like a few of these guys this week. I'm gonna throw them into a lineup. And um, yeah, and it, it totally depends on what kind of contest you're playing too. Right. So like I'm playing kind of the higher stakes, small field. So like I'm building in floor first. Okay. Um, because you don't have to beat a lot of people. So the way you'll build like a GPP lineup, something like the Million Maker, that's really big. Maybe you'll start with like a game stack. So like that Tampa Bay stack that I mentioned, like a, a Winston Evans and uh, OJ Howard. And that's your start, right? Maybe you bring it back with someone on the other side. Maybe you bring it back with Goodwin or something like that um, with upside uh, or Kittle, something like that. And then you'll build around your stack. So if you're, if you're trying to win a, big, a large scale GPP, a lot of times you'll want to start with your stack. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I'm yeah, I'm actually fucking uh, excited to listen to you for the next year or so, and maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll dive into the DFS. Yeah, man, this will be good. And, and I haven't played season long in, in forever, honestly. If you, I, haven't, I don't think I've played like a, a like I, I have a few leagues with like his buddies and stuff, but like seriously played season long uh, in, in a couple of years. So it's it's kind of like totally different ends of the spectrum. So I get that for sure. All right, maybe I'll have to rope you into a high stakes league next year. Um, did you want to cover any of the defense? I do have. Yeah, that. we can touch on them quickly. Um, I, I think the probably the highest equity defense is the Eagles, their largest favorite. Um, this Washington offensive line um, is just in shambles, basically. Um, I, I don't love the pace in that game, but you always want to target uh, large favorites in defense just because you want turnovers, right? Like, I don't care how much a team's going to score. I want pass attempts on the other side. I want high pace and I want pressure. So I'm more often than not looking at uh, the D-line situation versus that offensive line. Uh, so the Eagles check that box. They are extremely expensive. Um, the Chargers kind of right there as well. Jacoby Brissett, someone that will take sacks. Um, and the Colts, they do have one of the best offensive lines in the league. Um, but still, like Brissett had the highest sack rate in the league last year despite having that good O-line. So I still think there's a chance that you could grab a turnover there. Um, with the Chargers, they're ex pretty expensive as well. Um, if you really wanted to pay down, um, I I'm somewhat interested actually in San Francisco against Tampa Bay. So like one of the things that's really uh, strong, in my opinion, is that chalk offense, that, that offense that's really popular going for the defense on the other side, because a lot of times the game environment is great, right? Like we, we love the pace in that game. There's going to be pass volume on the other side. So if we happen to, it, I mean, if Winston goes out there and throws three picks, like you're not only getting a great performance from your defense you're passing all those teams that have the Winston stack right because you never play your defense with a main stack anyway so it's interesting uh Tampa Bay's offensive line's not very good too uh so I mean there's a there's a, a narrative there that yeah uh maybe Arians wants to kind of throw deep and do that whole thing but if there's not enough time like he's not gonna be able to do that anyway so uh, I'm a little bit interested in um in San Francisco they're they're really cheap um so they are only 2200 on DraftKings. so that kind of get lets you do whatever you want in other positions yeah, that, I was going to ask you about that game because, like, obviously everyone projects Winston's team to put up a million yards and points and whatever. Like, it, it wouldn't surprise anyone if Winston throws for 300 yards, three touchdowns, but also throws two picks, gets sacked like five times, one yep. or two of those being like a strip sack. It, it could get wild and it could be, you know, points for him, also points for the defense. So I'm actually uh, – I'm with you on that. And one of the points that I always make for, like, streaming defenses is always always take a team that's projected to win their game. Like, that yep. is first and foremost. Project to win their game. Um, I like to look at low over-unders. I know you like the high over-unders because obviously there's more passing involved. Maybe that's something I need to pivot towards. But I think as long as they're favorited to win their game, yep. um, that's the most important thing. So if it is a high over-under and they're favorited by a lot, then that's probably a good situation because the team can be throwing from behind. And yep. then I always want my team at home. And then if you're looking for like tiebreakers, I will always go to like the offensive defensive line matchups. But that will usually be kind of baked into the uh, the spread itself. So defenses are interesting just because everyone's got to stream them. Um, but like, I don't know. I got you, man. You're, you're, we're, we're in the same kitchen right now. We're just building different things, right? So it's, it's, it's interesting how the kind of there's parallels there. All right. Well, uh, I think that's all the DFS talk we got for you all today. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Obviously, you could find Joe at all the places that we mentioned earlier in the video. Those will be linked in the description. If you enjoyed, always hit that thumbs up. Smash the subscribe button if you are new. We will be coming back to you all with some DFS help every Saturday. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, Joe, thank you for joining us for the first week. Looking forward Sorry to having me, you, man. This will be fun. All right. Later. Yeah.